so this is something different that I've wanted to do for a while now and figured since I've already brought pretty much my two other forms of entertainment that bring me joy in life, music and gaming to the channel, so now it's just a whole hodgepodge of entertainment, why not dive into some cryptids and some legends, urban legends and stuff like that, which when it comes to this, I've mentioned a few times in a few different videos, if it was pertaining to this subject, aliens, I am all for, I believe in 100%, I believe aliens are here on this planet, I believe they've been on this planet, it's a whole thing, we'll get into that down the line, but then you have stuff like the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot, and as fun as they are to entertain the ideas of, when you just look at the facts and just the, the likeliness of these things existing without being seen or captured on, fo on a photograph or a video or anything like that, and no compelling evidence whatsoever, it starts to become very hard to believe in these things. But there's a few out there of these legends and cryptids that have always fascinated me. And the Mothman of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, is one, if not the number one, that has always grabbed my attention. Now, for people who don't know what the Mothman is, they made the movie The Mothman Prophecies based off of this whole legend. And it was basically this humanoid creature that was sighted in 1966, November, around November to December of the following year in 67. And people were seeing this creature all over the place in and around Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It looked and was described by dozens and dozens, and I'm talking over years, hundreds of people as a seven to nine, ten foot tall creature that had a wingspan of ten to fourteen plus feet and had glowing hypnotic eyes and it looked like a big mothman <laughs> and that's where it got its name which also was uh, the name was drawn from the Batman comics at the time that were very popular in the Batman show in the late 60s and there was in one of the comics there was a, a villain called mothman so it also came into it that way because they were calling it like bird creature and stuff at the beginning and like names that didn't stick mothman that's a name for a cryptid that sticks immediately so when i look at any type of urban legend or something like this i'm always very skeptic i always try to look on the skeptical side and on the scientific side and the common sense side and logic you know all of these great things that most people don't seem to use today but I'm like a mixture of Scully and Mulder from X-Files mix them together I'm the one who is always skeptical and will always try to find a logical explanation but god damn man do I want to believe and I want there to be a Mothman and I want there to be aliens and I want there to be Bigfoot like I want these things to exist I just don't know so let's dive into the whole backstory here of the Mothman see if we can try to figure out exactly what these people were seeing down there because one of the big ones that was thrown out as an idea an explanation for this was that they were seeing a sandhill crane or a, a certain type of heron i'll get more into that because just the fact that hundreds of people reported have seen this thing and you just see that picture of the crane <laughs> This thing doesn't look like a 10 foot tall, you know, 7 to 10 foot tall, big ass bird man. That, that looks like a bird. <laughs> so that doesn't work for me. That is, it's like the, that's pretty much the UFO equivalent being, it's swamp gas. 
doesn't work for me. The hundreds of people, none of them were able to... No, that's just a crane, bro. Like, I live here in West Virginia. Like, I, I hunt cranes and shit. That, that's a crane. No one was able to say that. That is just a stupid excuse. But there are things that can lend a little bit of credence to the crane theory. And we'll get into that, too. So let's talk the Mothman of Point Pleasant. The best place to start? Why not right at the beginning? So the first sighting of the Mothman was on November 15, 1966. And we had two young couples from Point Pleasant, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and we had Steve and Mary Mallet. They had an encounter outside of the town of Point Pleasant by the TNT area which is uh, the site of a former uh, munitions plant from the World War II era, which, keep that in mind, because that plays into a decent amount of theories, too, with what the Mothman can be. But the Mallet couple and the Scarberries, they saw this large creature whose eyes glowed red standing at the side of the road near the TNT area and they also described it as slender muscular like a man but about seven feet tall and she wasn't able to tell the face because of the hypnotic effect of the eyes the red eyes is the thing that you hear in every single report of the Mothman sighting. It's just the glowing red eyes. that it, It's almost trance-like. Which is another thing that goes against the whole Sand Hill Crane thing for me. Again, picture, see? Yeah, those aren't glowing eyes. Even in the dark. Come on. Like, that, it doesn't work for me. So, the two couples, they were chased by this creature all the way back into the Point Pleasant city limits. Back into town going about almost 100 miles per hour, and they were saying that this creature was keeping up with the car almost the entire way. And then it just disappeared. And over the next few days, more people started coming out with similar sightings, saying they saw a large bird with red eyes, and that's where it just blossomed from there. There started to be dozens upon dozens of sightings in that year from this first date 1966, November 15th, with Scarberry and the Mallets, up until the collapse of the Silver Bridge in 1967, which plays a big role into this whole legend as well. Now, the Silver Bridge was a suspension bridge that was built in the 20s, 1928, and it connected Point Pleasant, West Virginia, with uh, Gallipolis, Ohio. And in December 15th, 1967, it collapsed. They don't know what caused the collapse. They eventually found out, and I'll get into it, that it was a screw that could have come loose, but this even led more credence to the sightings of the Mothman. People claim to have seen the Mothman in the days right before the bridge collapsed, flying around the bridge. People's claim to see the Mothman on the bridge the day that it collapsed, when it collapsed. So, was it a, was it a bad omen? Was it there to warn the citizens of uh, Point Pleasant that there's going to be this disaster? Was it the cause of the bridge collapse? Is it just a mass delusion from everybody in this town? These are all great things to discuss, and we're going to get into all of that. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know if it's going to be a long-ass episode or if I'll do this episodically. I don't know. This is probably going to get cut up a whole bunch and edited all over the place, so who knows. But what really makes this whole legend and this whole case here interesting, even more so for me, it's not just the Mothman here. Like, when you, and I've looked into this case a, a decent amount of hours over my life. Like, I, I, like I said, I love this type of shit. There's, there was, it's not just the Mothman. There were UFO sightings and lights in the sky and stuff seen all around and in Point Pleasant. Right around the time of the Mothman sighting started. And ever since then, there are still a whole bunch of sightings of UFOs in that area. 
it seems like a UFO hotspot. There were men in black who came to Point Pleasant and started telling citizens to stop reporting what they're reporting. And so just we have men in black here. We have UFOs. We have lights in the sky. We have a cryptid bird man, moth man thing. <laughs> it, 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 there's so much to this. And it's so fun to think about and unravel. So now let's go back even further. Further than the first documented, reported sighting of this Mothman on the 15th of November in 66. Way back to the curse of Chief Cornstalk. What, JT? This thing has a Mothman, UFOs, men in black, and now there's an Indian curse? Are you fucking kidding me? Oh, I'm not kidding you one bit. There's a curse of Indian Chief Cornstalk here. Now, Chief Cornstalk was a Shawnee Indian leader in the late 1700s or so. And to make a long story short, he ended up getting killed. And there's this whole legend around him that he left a curse on the land. And I believe his grave was rediscovered and his remains were moved to the Mason County Courthouse grounds. And when the courthouse was torn down, then Cornstalk was reburied at the site of the Battle of Point Pleasant. That led to the whole curse of Chief Cornstalk, that this was his land and that his revenge was sending the Mothman in the 60s for some reason decades later <laughs> to go mess with Point Pleasant so, to me this is just urban legend this is just story mixed with history like there was a uh, Chief Cornstalk he existed he was a real person but that's where it ends for me it's just a story he died sure you want to say he left a curse you know how many fucking Indians died all over the country this whole place will be cursed maybe that's why the world's how it is now <laughs> Maybe it's old Native American curses finally coming back to haunt us. Now, just to give some, shed some light on who's in, involved here in Point Pleasant and the people who were seeing the Mothman in the late 60s. These aren't the type of people that want to go on record saying they've seen some crazy stuff. These are just small-town American people. They're hard workers. They just want to live their life, you know, enjoy their life, and they live a simple life. They're not the type of people that are just going to go out and say some shit and make it up just for, for 15 minutes of fame. That's not the type of people here. And you can see it. And if you look up on the Mothman, you look into all this, you see documentaries, you see probably see the same people that are interviewed several several times they're all locals these are people that have had their names established in this town for generations these are people that were well respected in their town these are people that aren't sham art they're not scam artists they're not trying to make a quick buck they're not trying to be famous for discovering some weird stuff this is some weird unexplained phenomena that they experienced that they didn't know what to do they didn't know what they experienced they didn't know what they saw and they didn't know how to handle it from there and they just ended up reporting their sightings of what they saw now they have a Mothman Museum in Point Pleasant run by Jeff Wamsley he owns this Mothman Museum that you can go in and see all, like, signing reports and artist sketches and everything like that. They have a huge statue of the Mothman in the center of town in Point Pleasant. So, I mean, you can't argue one thing. I mean, this has been great for tourism for Point Pleasant. <laughs> like, they have a, a festival every single year, a Mothman festival. So, brings in some nice tourism. Like, you can't deny that. Now, there was a woman named Mary Heyer 
who worked at the paper, I think I want to say, she started taking in all the accounts and sightings from people who have seen the Mothman, who are seeing strange lights in the sky, who are seeing UFOs. This was being seen all the time in Point Pleasant and around it. Mary Heyer herself was even visited by two men in black right around or right after the bridge collapse in 67 of the Silver Bridge and was told to stop reporting you know, these sightings and stop documenting everything and to stop talking about this. So right there is something weird. Then we have more crazy stuff with Indrid Cold, which is a whole nother thing. So this is probably going to be an episodic thing, <laughs> like as I go through this. I'll see how the initial reaction is to a shorter video here, and then we'll go into more and more parts of this whole entire huge story in the coming days. Now, welcome to the TNT area outside Point Pleasant, which I said earlier was a munitions plant in the Second World War. Now, this area is known for having uh, severe chemical spills into the ground from the munitions plant and everything, and all the chemicals and all the work and stuff that they, was, they were doing there during World War II seeped deep into the ground. So... The whole Sandhill Crane theory from earlier, like I said, this is a Sandhill Crane. This don't, that don't look like the Mothman here, <laughs> is the way everyone describes it. There's no way people are making that mistake. Now, there's a theory that it could have been a Sandhill Crane or a Heron or some type of bird like that that was mutated from living in the TNT area that was has all these chemicals deep in the ground. Who knows what type of mutations could have happened. Now that's one theory on the skeptical side that I'll that I put a pin in and I hold on to. Because it is possible. It's a logical explanation. It makes sense. This isn't something that people imagined. We can throw that right out. People actually saw something. Hundreds of people to this day have seen something. So we can put that right out that this is a hoax. We can throw it right out that this was just people losing their mind like a group delusion and seeing things that weren't there. There was definitely something. Now, was it a crane? A regular-ass crane? Like that fucker right there? Again, no. <laughs> Not... I, I, I refuse to believe that many people confuse that with that. I refuse to believe it. So, the whole mutated crane does have a little bit of credence to it. It does have science on its side. It does have logic on its side. That if this crane, or maybe there was multiple of them that were living in the TNT area... They became mutated, and this is what they were seeing. But it's still a crane. It still doesn't look like everything that all these eyewitnesses were describing that they're seeing. And the biggest thing being the eyes. Now, of course, you could see that the crane does have the red around the eyes. But that's not glowing, trance-like red eyes. And all the darkness in the world isn't going to make <laughs> the, the red on his face, on that crane, look like it's a trance-like alien-type eyes. So that's another thing there that doesn't make sense with the whole crane thing. Even if it was mutated, again, who knows what type of mutations. So, I mean, could he have glowy eyes? Who knows? It's still on the side of reason. It's still on the side of science in some way. But I did hear a theory once that was quite interesting. Speaking of all the chemicals and everything in the TNT area and how infested that area is, a lot of those chemicals can have hallucinogenic effects 
on people. Now that always struck me as something that could make sense. Now if these people are seeing this creature, and the, most of the accounts are in or around the TNT area, not all of them, I mean there's been a whole, and like I said, there's so much more that we have to dive into here, with the alien sightings, and intrad cold, and, and the, the, all the UFO stuff, and then the men in black goes on more, there, there's so much, this is like a little teaser, appetizer, uh, trailer for this little mini-series I'll be doing, but the ones that were in the TNT area, it could be possible that they were affected by the chemicals that were seeped into the ground after all these years. It could have brought about hallucinogenic effects, which mix that with a sandhill crane that's actually there, and <laughs> throw that together with somebody who's unknowingly going you know, hallucinating from the chemicals, that can make sense. There is a nice little explanation there, except it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't come close to explaining everything. Just the fact that Scarberries, the Scarberries and the Mallets were driving back to Point Pleasant when that first initial sighting and they said that they were being chased back into town 100 miles per hour. They weren't, they're in a car. They're not touching the ground. They're not in the TNT area and stuff. They're not being affected by chemicals. So that is one interesting theory that maybe can account for a few sightings, maybe a dozen, a few dozen, who knows. But it doesn't account for everything. So that's another theory that I can throw out right there. So what could the Mothman be? Is it a creature, an actual physical being, some like a Bigfoot or like a Loch Ness monster that just, or a Jersey Devil that we just never discovered? It's just a weird new species of creature we never discovered. A cryptid, <laughs> basically. That's one theory. Is it of alien origin? That's another big theory. And we'll go into that in the next episode on this, which will go into all the UFO activity that was going around, going on at the time of before the bridge collapsed with all the Mothman sightings and everything since then. All the stuff with Indrid Cold, which if you don't know that who that is or what it is, it's basically an extraterrestrial, supposedly, who visited a man and gave him premonitions and stuff like that it's the whole thing so we'll get into intra cold the aliens all that stuff in the next episode but either extraterrestrial in origin or alternate dimension and that's another thing that's fascinating to me just having things all around you look at like uh Stuart Gordon's From Beyond and, and so much of Lovecraft stuff but like in From Beyond when they're using the the machine that he built and he could see all the stuff the the creatures flying around and that's what's really in our air and like what around us but we just can't see it it's in a different plane of existence so is this mothman from a different plane of existence and every so often maybe there's different hot spots across the world you know paranormal hotspots or openings in time or dimension or space that would lead into another dimension or that would bring something out of another dimension and could this be where mothman comes from so we just talked about a decent amount of stuff here with the mothman in episode one we talked about the legend of Chief Cornstalk and the curse that he supposedly put on the land around Point Pleasant, West Virginia. We talked about the whole Sandhill Crane theory, the mutation theory that maybe it was a mutated crane or some type of bird. Talked about how the, the TNT area is so just fucked with chemicals and everything in the ground and that possibly it could be a hallucinogenic reaction that people were having and they were actually seeing something maybe a crane and 
unknowingly they were being affected by these chemicals and bam, Mothman. But we got a lot to dive into here, especially when we get into the real out there stuff with the UFO sightings and the strange lights in the sky and injured cold. That's what we're talking about this episode. Now, during the late 60s, 66, leading into 67, up to the bridge collapse, the Silver Bridge, there were there's just as many Mothman sightings and reports. There were just as many, if not more, reports of seeing orbs in the sky, unusual aircrafts, uh, lights performing maneuvers that defied all types of conventional explanation. Some accounts even mention encounters with humanoid figures associated with these UFOs. Now, the most notable UFO sighting in Point Pleasant took place on November 2nd, 1966, when we had two couples reported encountering a large gray creature near the TNT area, which I mentioned in the first video was a World War II munition storage area right outside of Point Pleasant, outside the town. And this is the hot spot for the Mothman sightings. It's also a hot spot for UFO sightings. So this couple was down there and following their encounter they claimed to observed a large glowing object in the sky that hovered and darted around before disappearing. And this incident is referred to as the Mothman UFO incident. This is what tied the Mothman sightings to the UFO activity and just added so much more mystery to this already strange phenomenon going on. This is also where theorists started putting together the idea that this Mothman creature could be either extraterrestrial in origin or it could be an interdimensional being as we mentioned and talked about in the last video and the UFO sightings were a part of its presence or its associated phenomenon. Others suggest that the sightings of both the Mothman and the UFOs were a result of psychological factors, mass hysteria, or a combination of misidentifications and hoaxes. We went into the whole misidentification thing with the crane. You know how I feel about that stupidity. Even with the mutation theory that can hold some ground, I stood on by it. So... We have UFO sightings and strange orbs and lights in the sky being reported and being sighted just as much, if not more, than the Mothman itself. This is what brings us to the infamous Indrid Cold. Now, who is Indrid Cold? Indrid Cold is a supposed humanoid figure that is supposedly supposed to be an extraterrestrial of some kind that was often mentioned in connection with the sightings and the encounters in Point Pleasant the UFOs, the Mothman sightings and he was referred to sometimes as the Grinning Man due to his unusual facial expression which was just a grin and he was according to some eyewitnesses who met Indrid Cold he spoke telepathically to them. So he had this grinning face on, no change in his facial expression, but he would relay the information of what he's saying to these people telepathically. Now, for when Indrid Cold first came into the whole Mothman story, he was believed to have made contact with, witness, with several witnesses in Point Pleasant during the same time period as the Mothman sightings in the late 60s. So some individuals reported encountering cold separately from their Mothman sightings, while others claimed to have seen both of them at the same time, injured cold 
and the Mothman together. So witnesses who encountered injured Cole described him as a tall and thin with a strange appearance and an unsettling constant grin. He's known for his ability to communicate telepathically and through odd buzzing sounds. Injured Cold would often ask questions about the witnesses' personal lives or deliver cryptic messages. His interactions were generally perceived as eerie and left people feeling unsettled and even frightened. You goddamn right frightened. Are you serious? Some grinning dude talking to me telepathically and I'm not going to be frightened? Now, there's a lot of theories on what exactly Indrid Cold was or is and the connection between him and the Mothman. Some people think that Cold and the Mothman were separate entities, that Indrid Cold was kind of an observer or a communicator for an unknown group of extraterrestrials. Other people think that Cold was a kind of manifestation of the Mothman itself kind of taking on a different form to interact with witnesses. That is kind of stupid. I, I mean, as like I said, as much as I want to believe in all of this and aliens and all that type of stuff, the Mothman itself, as a creature, say it does exist. Why would it take on a, a, a human form just to, to talk to witnesses that witnessed him? I, that's a little far-fetched. It's like a way far fetch. The whole story of Indrid Cold originated with a man named Woodrow Derenberger. Now, what's interesting about this is how I just mentioned with the UFO sightings that the major UFO event, that's like the, the Mothman UFO incident, took place on November 2nd of 1966. This takes place on the same date, November 2nd, 1966. We had Woodrow Derenberger, who was driving home from work in Parksburg, West Virginia, and he claimed to have been approached by a vehicle that he described as metallic and like an olive-shaped object, a UFO. So the vehicle reportedly was hovering above the ground and emitted a strange noise before it came to a full stop. So according to Darren Berger's account, a man stepped out of the vehicle and approached him. The man introduced himself as Indrid Cold and communicated with Darren Berger telepathically. Cold allegedly had a peculiar appearance, again with a broad grin, high-pitched voice, and an overall unsettling demeanor. Darren Berger, of course, freaking the hell out, I'm sure, at this point, reported that Indrid Cold asked him various questions about life on Earth, shared information about his home planet, and made cryptic statements about the future. This encounter with Cold and the subsequent interviews that Darren Berger gave about this experience gained pretty big attention and helped popularizing the figure of Indrid Cold in the Mothman lore and just... He's known, Indrid Cold, that name is known now just in UFO circles and alien circles and, you know, people who look into all that. It's worth noting, though, that while Darren Berger's account is the first widely known report of meeting Indrid Cold, there have been other similar encounters from individuals claiming to have encounters with the same or similar entities, alleged extraterrestrials that speak telepathically. We've heard this so many times when talking about UFOs and alien abductions and everything. They talk telepathically, that they don't have to communicate the way that we do. We've heard this many, many times, and this is just another thing that just links into all of this huge urban legend here of the Mothman now. So we have these UFO sightings. We have orbs in the sky. We have on the same night as the biggest UFO sighting in Point and around Point Pleasant is the same night that Indra Cold shows up to Derenberger. That's a little coincidental, and these are two reports coming from two separate parties. You know, the people who were involved with the UFO incident and Derenberger. Very coincidental, I think that's very interesting that it's on the exact same date. That on that date, 
while they were seeing lights in the sky and saw a craft. Derenberger also saw a craft and was visited by cold. Very interesting. Now, just like the Mothman has been theorized as being extraterrestrial in origin or interdimensional, same theories have been applied to injured cold. Again, the sighting that Derenberger claims seeing the UFO, seeing the craft hovering there would make you think that it's an extraterrestrial. But just like Mothman could possibly be an interdimensional being, we hear this with extraterrestrials all the time. Maybe they're from another dimension and we just can't see them. Now, let's put injured cold on ice for a little bit and go back and talk some more reported sightings here. Now, early on, in the very beginning of the sightings, a woman gave a statement saying that she remembers that it was not referred to as Mothman in the beginning. It was referred to as Birdman several, several times. Forget what I was talking about because I just made a call to the Mothman Museum <laughs> and left a message with the woman there of trying to get Jeff Wombly, who runs the museum, for an interview. So if that happens, I'll insert it into the final episode or so of this uh, series. Now comes in another theory, but this one is a lot more deeply rooted in legend, and specifically Native American legend. Now, the Thunderbird, it was a Native American, and you see this in so many Native American tribes and ancient Aztecs, and pretty much every civilization has had the myth of a giant firebird or a giant bird creature that would fly across the sky just like with the ufos just like with injured cold there has been a lot of theorizing whether there's a connection between the native american myths of the thunderbird and the sightings of the mothman it can make sense sure they're they're big winged creatures but when's the last time you saw a fucking Thunderbird? When's the last time you saw one? I'll wait. Never. So, again, this is just like the... For me, this is like the Chief Cornstalk stuff. Except not real at all. <laughs> he actually existed. The Thunderbird stuff, it's just more Native American lore. That's all it is. You, it's fun to theorize. It's fun to throw in. Maybe the Mothman is is related to all the old myths, ancient myths of Thunderbirds. But again, this is just fun speculation. There's nothing here to go off of to try to actually figure out what the Mothman was or is and what these people were seeing. Even more theorizing and stories tied to this legend is that there were supposedly a lot of satanic rituals and stuff allegedly that would go down in the TNT area. So not only does the TNT area outside of Point Pleasant have the Mothman tied to it, does it have these UFO sightings and the lights in the sky, but it also has of reputation for, again, supposed and alleged satanic uh, gatherings and rituals that would be taking place there. There definitely was some weird stuff going on in the TNT area, which just leads to more theories on did one of these cults or religious nutbags open up some type of portal to another dimension or unleash some type of curse upon the land the same with like the chief cornstalk curse there's like i said there's just layers and layers and layers to all of this that it's it's just a rabbit hole you can go down we're going down it together now a few more sightings and these are just 
a very very few and these are some of the more initial ones following scarberry and uh, the mallets their drive back into point pleasant where they were chased by this supposed mothman there was an incident and it's i think it's interesting too that these are all within days of each other that happened on the 15th of uh, November with uh, Scarberry and Mallet. The next day, on the 16th, Thomas Urey, who was a contractor, reported seeing a large bird-like creature in the TNT area. He described it as having huge red eyes and a 10-foot wingspan. So this is a day after the initial sighting. Then on the 24th of, of November 1966, Marcella Bennett, a resident of Point Pleasant, reported encountering the Mothman near her home. She described it as a large gray creature with wings and large red eyes. The next day, November 25th, Connie Carpenter reported seeing the same creature while visiting her father's home in Point Pleasant. She claimed to have seen a large bird-like creature with glowing red eyes. This last one is the day of the collapse of the Silver Bridge, which connected Point Pleasant to Ohio and resulted in the deaths of 46 people. Some witnesses reported seeing the Mothman in the area before the bridge collapsed, leading to speculation of a connection between the two events, which we talked about in the last video. Now, another interesting thing with this case is after the collapse of the Silver Bridge on the 15th of December in 67, a lot of, pretty much most of the reports of Mothman stopped for a little bit. There were still here and there reports. Same with the UFOs and everything, but it all kind of slowed down. Now, you can look at this as... Two different things. The more logical side would make you think that people were seeing something, like we established, they weren't seeing any, they weren't seeing nothing, but they were seeing something. So let's go with the Sandhill Crane theory, just to go with it. You have this small town. In a matter of a few days you're getting reports coming in of seeing this large bird-like creature in the TNT area. Then, a year later, almost to the day, you have the bridge collapse after a year of a bunch of reports and sightings of the Mothman. Then you have this huge tragedy happening in this small town where 46 are killed in this bridge collapse. And then nothing on the Mothman for a little bit. It's almost as if people stopped paying attention to it because something much more severe and tragic was happening. Something more realistic was happening. Reality happened. And hence, the story stopped for a little bit. I don't know. I, I, I want to lean that way. The skeptic in me does. But, again, there's so much more to this whole case than just the Mothman that I can't make a decision just on that. Or, you can look at the other side of it. That, after the bridge collapse... The reason that he wasn't reported being seen for a little while after this is because he was some type of omen, as we mentioned in the last video. A good omen, a bad omen, whichever. He was there for the bridge collapse. The bridge collapsed, hence he gone. Makes sense, too. Now, in a lot of the documentaries I've seen on the Mothman and everything to do with Point Pleasant... They kind of mention this every single time, what I was just talking about, that 
in 66, 67, with the height of the sightings, after the bridge collapsed, it slowed down considerably. But there were still sightings pretty consistently through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then it kind of ramped up and we started getting more and more frequent sightings. But in 1985, there were mysteriously large feathers that were found in an igloo in the TNT area. So nobody ever found out, to my knowledge, where those feathers came from. I mean, if you, you would think if this creature is living in the TNT area, you'd be finding feathers all over the place. But again, who knows what this was? Again, was it a crane? Was it the, the feathers of a sandhill crane that was just living in the TNT area? That's a possibility to explain the feathers. Then we have an interesting report from a woman named Leah Wilson in August of 1987 that she heard a noise outside of her house. So she was at her family farmhouse. It was around 2 in the morning. She was just watching movies and she was getting ready to go to bed and she hears a screeching sound from outside. And the only way that she could describe it after process of elimination, she thought maybe it was an owl at first, and said, there's no way that this is an owl. She said the only way she can describe it is, like, from the movies, like the pterodactyl's shrieks. That's how she's able to describe it, that it was so loud and piercing that she had to get up and look outside and see if she could see what this was. So she goes to the window and she opens the, the blinds and she sees the Mothman creature there. The wingspan is so big it's covering the window, like it's blocking out, she can't see past this thing. That's how big it is and that's how big the wingspan was. Now she says when it went on top of the house. Because after she went out and looked out the window and saw this creature, it and she could hear the whoosh. Like, it was so loud that she can hear it going from in front of the house to the top of the house. Now, there was another account from 87 from a young girl in high school. She was in school in, in 87. Her and her boyfriend were going up to Quincy Hill, which is outside of Point Pleasant or a nearby town, and they saw a creature that she described was like six feet tall and it looked like an insect. Like his knees went, were bent backwards and it made it walk in a very unnatural way. And this has been described by several eyewitnesses as the way that it walks, that it walks in a very unnatural way, almost like a bird. And a common thing that's been reported with a lot of these eyewitness sightings is the way that the Mothman walks in sightings that were not him flying around and shit that he has this weird shuffling gait to it that it's not used to walking on its legs and this has been reported several other times with Mothman sightings so as we can see the strangeness is piling up the mysteries and the questions are piling up and there is so much more Next episode, we'll dive into the men in black making their appearance in Point Pleasant. More on Mary Heyer, the journalist who was chronicling and uh, keeping account of all these people who were calling in with their experiences and that everything that they've seen. And see if we can uh, figure out any more theories on what this could possibly be. The identity of the Mothman of Point Pleasant. 
Hello, boils and ghouls. I got it right that time. All right, guys, welcome to episode three on the Mothman of Point Pleasant. Trying to figure out what exactly this creature was, is, could have been, what these people in Point Pleasant and the surrounding areas could have been seeing down there. First, I just want to say thanks so much, guys, for the real positive uh, feedback and stuff on on the last two videos on doing this because uh, like I said this is something I've wanted to do and talk about for a while so um, I've been getting a lot of good feedback and uh, the views have been good on this so um, I'm glad that it's at least interesting uh, to some people and we'll probably be doing this for uh, other cryptids and mysteries legends etc down the road but let's recap a little on our mission here to f try to figure out what the mothman was or is i say was and is because i talk back in the late 60s the 66 to 67 year of all the initial sightings before the collapse of the silver bridge and then just to the, to this day there's still sightings so what it was back then is it this the same thing the same exact creature that people are seeing today and in the last few decades, that was there for the bridge collapse? Or was that just, like we've talked about in the past, a bad omen, a good omen, whichever one, and his job there was done? And that's why sightings about him went down right after the bridge collapse. In addition to a more plausible reason is that this was not a delusion, and we've gone over this, that that's one thing we can rule out, at least I'm ruling out, is that this is something that people are just thinking they're seeing, but they're not seeing anything. They definitely were seeing something. So I take that right out that it's a hoax, like this isn't a hoax, this has been seen by so many people and documented by so many people, reported, so the fa it's not a hoax. Misidentification we've talked about with the sandhill crane and similar cranes and herons and birds that shouldn't be in the West Virginia area. They're not native there, but somehow, you know, got during migration, they ended up stopping in Point Pleasant in 66, 67, at least one of them. We've talked about how I feel about that whole theory. The, the crane here looks nothing like this here, that is the description that we've heard over and over again from the Mothman. So I can throw that out too. Now we talked about the mutation theory that possibly because of the TNT area being so heavily just contaminated from TNT chemicals that were being used in World War II in the munitions plant there, that they even had people come, like government agencies come, to cl try to clean up the area. Like it's, it's no secret that there is a bunch of chemicals in the TNT area, and that they'll likely, there always will be. Like you, you don't get that type of chemicals out of the ground permanently forever. So was it a mutated crane? Was it a mutated bird of some kind? This is one I still have to s keep on the shelf. I have to stick that one on the bookshelf of possibilities for where I'll try to, at the end of this series, come to my conclusion on what I think this really is or was. So the mutation theory, again, I'm going to have to keep because there is c credibility to that. It does make sense scientifically. It does make sense logically. And you know how they say Occam's razor, you know, usually the most simplest explanation is what the explanation is. Of course, that's not how it always is. And when we're talking about stuff that's possibly paranormal or alien, extraterrestrial, then those rules go out the window as well. So the theory on the chemicals affecting eyewitnesses and possibly causing hallucinogenic effects and they were actually seeing something, maybe it was a crane, maybe it was just some other bird, and that was making them 
actually see something much scarier, more frightening, and can explain the trance-like feeling of staring into its eyes. I touched on that. I think it's a very interesting theory. I think it, it definitely could be responsible for some of the sightings, but not all of them. As we said, even the first real sighting with uh, the scarberries and the mallets, they were driving the entire time. Like, they were driving on the main road, passing the TNT area, back into Point Pleasant. So there was no chemicals affecting them, and this is when the Mothman was chasing them all the way back to town at 100 miles per hour at one point, and then disappeared. So I'll take that theory, and I'll add it to the mutation theory, and just keep it as a side note, but I in no way think that accounts for everything. It, there's no way it can. And then we have the group delusion theory, which I didn't touch on much because I don't think this is what it is. But we have that this small town that could have been, and they were shaken up at these sightings and stuff. These people were afraid. They didn't know what this creature was that they were seeing. And that's, again, lends credibility to both the character of these eyewitnesses. These are kind, hardworking people in a small town. They don't, they've had their names established there forever, for generations, some of them. They don't, they're not the type that just want to report stuff like this and sound like a lunatic. Like, they saw something and it frightened them. And it was starting to scare the entire town of Point Pleasant during 66 up until the bridge collapse to the point that they, a lot of people had a feeling that it was leading up to something, that something bad was going to happen, that it, it just, that you could feel it in the air, like the aura, everything. It just, there was just a feeling that it was all of this craziness with the, seeing the UFOs and the, and the strange lights and orbs in the sky, the, all the Mothman sightings, the men in black, all of this was leading to something big. And some think that the bridge collapse was that thing it was leading up to, which is why I try to separate the pre-bridge collapse Mothman sightings with everything afterwards, because possibly could be a different creature or a different misidentification or a whole different separate entity to what the Mothman was leading up to the bridge collapse. If that was just him being an omen, then he left. Then maybe what people have been seeing there ever since is another cryptid that looks like a big flying creature, which there are a ton of those. We touched a little bit on the Thunderbirds in the last episode, or the Native American beliefs in the Thunderbirds, the giant birds that would fly over the sky that could be linked to the Mothman. There's a whole bunch of other ones in modern times, like in the last few centuries, that are in all different other uh, states in the United States, in Canada, basically on every continent on the planet. <laughs> Just like there's a Bigfoot everywhere, same thing here with a flying cryptid. So that might be an episode to come. It's just related cases and cryptids to the Mothman. And maybe this is all part of one big thing, that this is all being looked at as small pieces of a giant puzzle. And maybe the Mothman is one entity, maybe it's a species. Now that's getting into the theories on the paranormal side. Could this be just a creature, like a, exactly what a cryptid is, that we haven't discovered yet? On that side of it, I'm going to take that off the shelf. Because it's kind of what takes away any of my belief nowadays in Bigfoot and the Loch, Loch Ness Monsters. Somebody would have seen this thing. Someone would have gotten a picture of it. Someone would have got a video of it. We would have found remains. We would have anything like that, especially being contained for the most part around and in Point Pleasant and especially the TNT area. 
There were feathers found in one of the igloos in the TNT area. I mentioned that in the last episode. This was in the mid-80s, though. Still, they're feathers. Anyone never take them to get tested at a university, see what type of feathers? No, so, like, there's no information there. But the fact or the theory of it being a cryptid in the sense that we all know when we think of cryptids as an undiscovered species, an animal or something, I don't think that's the case at all, and I'm taking that off as, an, as a possibility and an explanation. The next, this is when it really goes, you know, the paranormal alien route, is that it is extraterrestrial in origin. That it is somehow also linked to the UFO sightings in the area leading up to the bridge collapse during all the Mothman sightings as well. And to this day, like I said, it's a hot spot over there in uh, West Virginia. It's particularly around Point Pleasant for UFOs and lights in the sky and orbs. So is this all related? And the Mothman is some type of, you know, alien entity. We touched on a lot on injured cold in the last episode the supposed extraterrestrial that visited woodrow derenberger when he was driving home and saw a craft land and injured cold came out introduced himself talked telepathically so there was a theory i mentioned in there that that could be another manifestation of the mothman injured cold and mothman could be the same thing I don't really buy that theory, but it's, it's, you can't deny it, like, there's no proof against it, so I'll let it stand for now, but all of this coming into consideration, and the fact that the men in black make an appearance here, I think is another big point in the direction that this is something extraterrestrial or paranormal and that the government knows about this and maybe not particularly the mothman and like what this is exactly but just like all other cases the government has denied and everything and that we've heard men in black uh stories about which that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of the episode here is the men in black and Mary Heyer and her visit from them and other cases involving the men in black. I'm not talking Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> we all know that's a great movie. The sequels aren't that good, though, but this has nothing to do with the Mothman. We're going to dive into the men in black. But the fact that they were involved too, plus the UFOs and the lights in the sky and the Mothman sightings, and there were other just weird things happening in town, and like chickens disappearing overnight, and like a lot of strange stuff. And that's why people thought it was leading up to something like a disaster, and it did with the bridge collapse. So the fact that the men in black showed up, that really points to me that this, if not explainable in a logical, scientific way, this is assuming that Mothman is real and that it is either extraterrestrial in origin, paranormal, or, or it, it's from another dimension. So, what are the men in black? For those of you who... I'm assuming most are into this type of stuff. Otherwise, why are you listening? But for people who just discover this or this mystery and, and legend in particular, and for some reason never heard of Men in Black, it's just like the movie. <laughs> it was based actually on these stories and, you know, alleged accounts and meetings and encounters with these supposed Men in Black that they work for some type of government agency they never it's never revealed what they work for but it's they usually travel in pairs i know that sounded like dogs or some shit but whatever they travel in pairs is where you hear in a lot of sightings and encounters with them usually with all dressed in black black suits black sunglasses black hats black ties 
and they end up going and visiting people who have either had UFO slash alien encounters or sightings, and they will tell them to stop talking about what you saw. Stop talking about what you think you saw. You didn't see anything. And they would pretty much come up, they would threaten them without directly threatening them. Some people have even, there's been some cases that they were directly threatened. But this goes back to the, like the 40s, the mid to late 40s. In 1947, there was a man who claimed that a man in black, guy in a dark suit, warned him to not discuss his UFO sighting on Maury Island. We have it in the 50s as well. We have, through every decade, there's been reports of this being tied in with alien sightings, UFO sightings, alien abduction, all of that. John Keel, who is somebody we have not talked much about yet, and we will have a whole episode on, is the ufologist who came to Point Pleasant to try to figure out what was going on with the Mothman in the late 60s. And he ended up writing his findings and what he, you know, experienced there and learned from everybody else, heard from people, wrote The Mothman Prophecies, the novel, which was then adapted into the movie with Richard Gere and Laura Linney, which is a great film. But Keel claimed to have encounters more than one time with the men in black and referred to them as demonic supernaturals with dark skin and or exotic facial features. This is another thing that we hear about the men in black in a lot of the reports and sightings on them is that they act very unnatural almost as if they're not from this planet. Like, I've heard cases of, like, one of them looking at a, at a pen in an odd way, like he didn't know how a pen worked, or looking at a phone in the same way, like showing a little bit of curiosity towards something, but it not being natural because they don't know what it is. Which leads to a whole theory there that these aren't government agents, that they're actually extraterrestrials themselves, or in, in some way that they're extraterrestrials, paranormal, alternate dimension. We're just going to loop that all together under the supernatural extraterrestrial banner, that they could be some other species of extraterrestrial that's trying to make sure that us humans don't spread the word and find out about others, other species of aliens out there. So you can get way out there with the men in black, but there's some significant cases that are very interesting. Keels being uh, one of them, but we'll talk about Keels in his own episode. The first interesting case of the men in black is actually the very first recorded one that I can find. And it's the one I mentioned in 1947 from Harold Dahl. So he was interviewed, and this was his response on his sighting. On June 21st, 1947, in the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, I was patrolling the East Bay of Maury Island. I, as captain, was steering my patrol boat close to the shore of a bay on Maury Island. On board were two crewmen, my 15-year-old son and his dog. As I looked up from the wheel on my boat, I noticed six very large donut-shaped aircraft in the sky. He then went on to say that one of the crafts that he saw in the air started to litter this type of, it looked like newspaper to him, debris from what seemed like underneath the ship which turned out being some type of light metal fragment, he says. And it ended up crashing onto the boat, killing his dog, and his son had his arm broken from this falling debris. He was then visited by a man in black, a singular one, and told him to not tell anyone what you saw, of not what happened, and he got his first visit here. This is the first time we heard of the man in black. Now... 
the FBI did investigate this case and concluded that was it was a hoax. Just putting that out there. Even though this is the fucking FBI. We don't believe a word they say. Now, a very interesting one, and for probably this reason alone, we have a photograph of one of the men in black in this case. It's from 1968, New Jersey, Jack Robinson. Him and his wife were living in their apartment. He was a UFO researcher, which men in black have been known to visit UFO researchers or people who have seen UFOs and are talking about their sightings, the whole gamut. So he and his wife were seeing this man in black across the street from their apartment that would just stand there like at all different times of the day for days on end and when they would leave and come back they would notice that their stuff was rummaged through all their their paperwork possessions their drawers everything was gone through their friend timothy was able to get this picture which is one of the few pictures of a supposed man in black so just for this alone it's interesting of course it could just be a guy in a suit <laughs> i mean it's not even a suit it's just a guy you know just chilling there and have nothing to do with anything but interesting nonetheless now just on what i said just there on it could just be some guy this is what Keel argues in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, that some of these encounters with the men in black could be explained as entirely just mundane events that just are kept going through uh, and told over and over again through folklore. So even though he has his own sightings of them and interactions, which, again, we'll talk about. One last one that I just think is hysterical just because because I never heard of this, but in 2002, in January, in New York, actor Dan Aykroyd had a encounter with the supposed Men in Black. He was putting, he sold a show called Out There that was supposed to like blow the lid off. A whole bunch of topics like UFOs and alien abductions, crop circle, and um, all all of that. And he ended up going outside, and he saw a black car and a man in black just appear across the street. The man in black looked at him, gave him kind of like a, we're disappointed in you or you shouldn't be doing this type of grin, and look... And he just disappeared along with the vehicle. Like a few seconds later. Now this is coming from Dan Aykroyd. He went back inside and was told by, I guess, the producers that he was selling the show to. That bad news, we can't go along with the show. We have to cancel it. We're not showing any of them. So that's a little odd. (laughs) I mean, it's Dan Aykroyd. I don't know how much of a partier he was his whole life, (laughs) but take that for what it is. Dan Aykroyd has actually seen a man in black. Now, I've shown a picture a few times in the last two videos of the men in black. This is from an actual case, and... There's video footage, which makes this probably the most important one. Now, this took place in 2008, so not too long ago in the grand scope of everything, especially in the Mothman story. October 14, 2008, in Niagara Falls. This happened to somebody somebody named Shane Sovar. So Shane Sovar, who was a hotel manager, along with one of the staff members, saw a big triangular UFO in the sky near Niagara Falls. Now, after the sighting a few weeks later, 
the same hotel that he that Shane managed. He wasn't working that day, neither was the other co-worker who saw the UFO. But two men in black supposedly came in and spoke to one of the staff. And she described them as the usual dress, not dress, but you know what I mean, how they dress. The usual black suit, black hats, but they had no eyelashes and they had no eyebrows, which has been reported in other sightings and encounters with men in black. Not a lot that I've heard, but I have heard other instances of this and that they had very big eyes and that they were acting very unnaturally, like I was mentioning earlier. And when Shane came back to work and heard this, he went over the security footage and this was the footage that he saw. Now, again, could it just be two people in suits and this woman is just making it up? Could it have been a hoax? Absolutely. Same with all of these. So the men, the whole men in black thing as a whole, I'll keep it on the shelf on the paranormal side, but it's something that is so easily disproven and so easily can be not what it is taken as in the UFO community and in these types of stories and legends that it could just be actual U.S. government officials and there is some type of cover-up. They could be paranormal, they can be extraterrestrial, other dimensional, or they can just be regular people in suits. <laughs> so it can go either way with them. Now, Mary Heyer, the journalist who was taking in all of these reports and encounter sightings and stuff from all these eyewitnesses was also visited by the men in black. There was another woman named Connie Carpenter who had an experience in the sighting of the Mothman who was then almost dragged and kidnapped, almost dragged into an old black sedan by a man in black and for several weeks afterwards stuff in our house would be repositioned they would show up in in weird places like her house was being broken into and when Mary Heyer was visited by these men in black they asked her and this was December of 67 and they asked her quote what would she do if somebody ordered her to stop writing about flying saucers? Then, later the same day, another one came by, asked the same question. What would you do if someone told you to stop writing about UFOs or flying saucers? And he claimed that he was a UFO researcher. The next day, Linda Scarberry, the one of the people involved in the very first sighting of the Mothman that were chased back to town ended up getting visited by a man in black who asked the same question, which, I mean, she wasn't writing about it, I guess, but she told her story. And, of course, how could we forget our friend Devin Berger, who was the one who was visited by Indrid Cold, the extraterrestrial grinning man on his way home. He was visited several times by the men in black. People in his town were visited and questioned about him and his supposed sighting. And just like 
the earlier case with the Men in Black that I mentioned in the apartment in Brooklyn, Robinson, Derringer's place was completely torn apart on several occasions and he was missing his writings, his letters, things that he was writing about regarding his experience. So these last few examples were all right in Point Pleasant or right around it and connected directly to Point Pleasant to the Mothman, to the UFO sightings, to everything. Yeah, say what you want about the Men in Black as a whole. Just the fact that these people were visited by somebody, by these government, quote-unquote, possible officials, whatever they are. Mary Heyer saw them, John Keel saw them, Derringer was visited by them. Um, Linda Scarberry was visited by them. So, all directly tied to the Mothman. And it's our job to figure out why. Alright guys, the next episode we're going to be talking all about John Keel, his book The Mothman Prophecies, all the research he was doing in Point Pleasant when he arrived to town, and... Let's see if we can shed some more light, dive deeper, and figure out exactly what the Mothman of Point Pleasant truly is. Hello, boils and ghouls. All right, guys. Welcome to another episode of The Mothman of Point Pleasant. Now, in the last few episodes, we have talked a lot about the Mothman, about the UFO sightings, the strange lights in the sky, all happening in Point Pleasant between November 66 and the bridge collapsing in 67, December. We've talked about the men in black who made their appearance in town. We've talked a few eyewitness sightings. And we've had a little bit of mention in the last episode about John Keel. So, this whole episode is going to be centered around Keel. Now, who was John Keel aside from the writer of the Mothman Prophecies? John A. Keel was an American author and paranormal investigator who gained significant recognition for his research on the Mothman phenomenon. Keel was born on March 25, 1930 in Hornell, New York. Fellow New Yorker, I like him. And unfortunately passed away on July 3rd of 2009. Now, Keel developed a strong interest in the unexplained from an early age and began writing articles on UFOs and other paranormal subjects. In the 1960s, he became actively involved in investigating various paranormal incidents, including, and most famously, the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Keel arrived in Point Pleasant and began investigating all the sightings. And then his book, The Mothman Prophecies, was published in 75, and it went on to become a seminal work on the subject. In his book, Keel not only details the Mothman encounters, but also delves into other strange occurrences in the area, such as UFO sightings, men in black encounters, and other paranormal phenomena. Keel was a very interesting and for me credible witness and researcher in this whole Mothman phenomena. I've read the Mothman prophecies. It's been at least 10 years since I've read the book. It's been a while since I've seen the movie too, which I think is a nice way of wrapping this series up when I do will be a regular discussion video like I do with all, all horror movies and all films on my channel here, and I'll do a video on the Mothman Prophecies film, bringing it back around to film, and that'll be a nice way to close this series out. But it's been a long while since I've read the Mothman Prophecies. But what I've always found very compelling about Keel, he never claimed to understand what went down in Point Pleasant. Like, you see a lot of this with UFO researchers, and I mean, look at the, the fucking ancient alien guy who's on every episode, and this guy's been talking shit for years. 
makes all of the credible people and researchers in the whole UFO community and everything, paranormal community, makes them look like just as kooky as he is. Can't stand that guy. But Keel was different. He went down there after hearing about these sightings and he just gathered information. He just went and talked to a bunch of eyewitnesses that, keep in mind, over a hundred sightings of this Mothman just in the 13 months between November of 66 and the bridge collapsing in December of 67. So, we've already talked about group hysteria and if this was a mass hallucination, I don't think that holds water. We've talked about the crane, the Sand Hill crane being misidentified or possibly mutated. As much as you guys know how I feel about that theory, I still have to leave it on the shelf a possibility as it's one of the only like scientific and logical explanations <laughs> for everything. And again, it doesn't even account for everything, including the UFOs and injured cold and all of the other strange phenomena going down in Point Pleasant. All it would explain is the Mothman creature itself. So it still doesn't explain even anywhere close to everything. But I have to keep it on the shelf of possibility just so we have some type of logical explanations that we can go back to. But Keel never claimed to know or figure out exactly what all of this meant. Like people would write him and talk to him years, decades after the whole incident in Point Pleasant in the late 60s and would say, what happened down there? What happened with the Mothman? And he would say, I have no idea. Like, so it's, it's, he's, he was a very credible person. He could have ran with the story and started just going off with a, all different type of crazy theories and say, oh, I know, I've seen them making stuff up left and right. He didn't do that. He just went, listened, recorded, documented until he started having his own sightings of lights in the sky, of UFOs, of seeing and being visited by the men in black. So I think it's interesting to this mystery, trying to explain it, and then he got sucked in himself and started experiencing all of these things that everybody he was talking to in town were experiencing. Now, one of Keel's central theories was that the Mothman sightings were not isolated incidents, but part of a larger pattern of high strangeness. He believed that these phenomena were interconnected and tied to a broader cosmic or interdimensional reality. Keel proposed that the Mothman and other supernatural entities were manifestations of a trickster-like intelligence manipulating and influencing human perception. Keel's investigations and writings on the Mothman and other paranormal subjects garnered both acclaim and criticism. His work often challenged conventional explanations and pushed the boundaries of paranormal research. Keel himself coined the term ultra-terrestrial to describe entities that existed beyond our normal understanding of reality. While Keel is primarily known for his association with the Mothman, he investigated numerous other paranormal incidents throughout his career. He explored topics such as UFOs, psychic phenomena, ancient mysteries, conspiracy theories. He has other books including Our Haunted Planet, Disneyland of the Gods, The Eighth Tower, and these all reflected his wide-ranging interests and in unconventional approach to the unexplained. Now, one thing that we've touched on a little bit, but didn't go greater into, is the theory that the Mothman is some type of harbinger of doom, or a good omen slash a bad omen, or in some way is trying to warn or tell people about an upcoming disaster. Now, of course, we know how tragic the Silver Bridge collapse was. Now, mind you, and they do a very, very good job in the film 
the Mothman prophecies of really capturing how devastating the bridge collapse was for this small town. You hear 46 people die in a tragedy. Nowadays, that's like, all right, so 40-something 40, 40 people, that's right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the Twin Towers, when that happened, you have thousands of casualties, and you have plane crashes, you have over 100 something people died so when you hear a bridge collapse 46 people died some people just brush that off and say eh, you know it could have been worse yeah it could have but this was a small town of only several thousand people so when you scale it down like that 46 people dying right before the holidays in December, every single one of those 46 people were someone to somebody in that town. Every single one of them were a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle, a nephew, a niece, a cousin. It goes on and on. So this bridge collapse that all of this strange activity was leading up to and as I mentioned in the last video, seemed to cease after the collapse of the bridge. And when I say cease, maybe I didn't make it clear enough in the last video, it all stopped. According to all documented reportings and stuff, once the bridge collapsed, there were no more Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant. There were no more UFO sightings. There were no more strange lights in the sky. There were no more men in black. None. Nothing. None of the strange phenomena seemed to occur after the bridge collapsed, which is what a lot of people and skeptics who believe that this was just some big type of mass hysteria, and I touched on this previously, that it does make sense that once the bridge collapsed, reality hit, and you know, this was actually a big tragedy for a small town. This was actual reality happening, not all the strangeness that was happening the 13 months leading up to it. And it knocked them out of this hysteria. The, the whole hysteria angle and mass delusion, I'm going to have to put that back on the shelf and stick it there for a little. Just like I said with the crane thing, just so we have some logical things to grasp onto at the, near the end of this when we start trying to really deduce what the most likely explanation for what happened in Point Pleasant with the Mothman could have possibly been. But the way the bridge collapse is shot and shown in the Mothman Prophecies film. It gets you. It really does. It really makes it hit home. Like, it's different hearing about and reading a, a paper that, I, that I've thrown up a few times on here, The Bridge Collapse 46 Dead. It's different reading that, and it's different seeing on screen. Yeah, it's a movie, of course, but still, the way it's shot, the way that you see all these people on the bridge scurrying for their lives and trying to get off this bridge before it collapsed and then just seeing the bridge start to come apart and then collapse. When this bridge collapsed, it was gone. Like, it all sunk and fell into the water underneath. There was no bridge left. And... We'll talk more on the bridge disaster near the end because there's some very odd things and coincidences that tie into the bridge collapse, tying it all back into the Mothman sightings and everything like that. Now, the whole theory on the Mothman or similar winged creatures and cryptids and, and flying birdmen like the Thunderbird legends of the Native Americans that we've touched on before. These type of creatures, including people referring to it as 
either the same Mothman or another Mothman, have been seen just before disasters many other times. There's one example is Mexico City in 1985, just weeks before a major earthquake that shook the entire city. There was sightings of giant birds, giant bird creatures flying above Mexico City for weeks leading up until this earthquake. In 1986, in the Ukraine, leading up to the incident at Chernobyl, locals were claiming to have seen, been visited by, been terrorized by a giant bird-like creature, a bird-like man, leading up to the accident at the power plant. So this creature has been seen as some type of harbinger of doom throughout history, but just Point Pleasant, Mexico City, Chernobyl, and those are just two other examples. There are a bunch out there. Like I said, I'll probably do an episode on similar and related winged cryptids. I'll touch more on that in that episode. Now, the whole movie adapted from the Mothman Prophecies. When I first saw the film, I was kind of disappointed. And I think that's only because I saw it in 2002 when it came out. So I was pretty young. And I was expecting a lot more, you know, Mothman. <laughs> and a lot more, like, I guess I was th expecting more of a documentary. You know, telling you about the Mothman and all the sightings and the UFO stuff. And that's not what you get in the film. And it actually, like I said earlier, with the way that Keel repeated you know, gathered this information and conducted his research down there. It makes sense the film is the way it is because it doesn't lean one way or the other. It doesn't lean towards this thing existed and this is true or anything like that. It just kind of presents the facts as they were told to Keel and we see everything play out the way that it did historically with the bridge collapse. So, when I revisited the film years later, that's when I fell in love with it. After a lot, a lot of time looking into, reading into, watching documentaries on this whole case of the Mothman, is when the Mothman Prophecies, the film, really hit for me more than it ever did. So, in the film, there's a lot of, well, fucking prophecies, <laughs> because of the title. And Will Patton plays a character in the movie who is basically based on Woodrow Derringer, who was the person who saw Indrid Cold, the extraterrestrial grinning man, who greeted him on his drive home. And started seeing him and having communications with Indrid Cold over this period of time. So, they don't call him uh, Derringer in the film. It's a different name. Same with Klein is the name of John Keel in the movie. And his life is semi-fabricated in the film as well. He's, his wife passes away at the beginning of the movie. So, there's, there's definitely changes to, I guess, make it not too autobiographical and, you know, to make it more of a film and cinematically pleasing and all that. But in the film, Derringer, we'll just call him Derringer, tells John Klein, Richard Gere's character, two different things. One, that he was told by Indrid Cold that 99 will die. And then several scenes later, in a diner, Richard Gere walks over to the TV, turns it up, and there was a flight crash where 99 people were presumed dead. So this was a premonition, a vision, a prophecy that was told supposedly from Injured Cold to Woodrow Derringer, and it turned out being true. Now, this is just in the film I'm speaking of. I do not remember 
if this happened in real life. I don't think it did. But then he also has another scene where he, he was told by Indrid Cold that 300 people would die. And then he shows a newspaper to Klein and it ends up saying earthquake at the equator, over 300 dead. So prophecies did play a part in this case. Mary Heyer, the woman we've talked about who worked for the paper, she was having a lot of dreams, intense dreams, and she was having dreams of Christmas presents floating in the water. We also see this referenced by Laura Linney's character in the Mothman Prophecies when she recounts a dream that she had, and this is basically where they took the inspiration for that. They said she was having a dream in the movie of Christmas presents floating in the water and she was drowning. Mary Heyer had these exact type of dreams. She had a very bad feeling that something major, a disaster, was coming. She's not the only one either. Aside from physical sightings, like in person, a lot of townspeople in Point Pleasant were having weird dreams like this. They were having strange premonitions or strange visions, and none of this could be explained. And again, going into the character of these witnesses, these are all people that were terrified at what they saw. And now we're going to dive into just a bunch of reported sightings from these eyewitnesses in Point Pleasant or right around it. These all take place in the 13 months from 66, November 15th, leading up to the bridge collapse in December 67. Linda Scarberry, who was one of the four, the two couples, the Scarberries and the Mallets, for the first official sighting of the Mothman in Point Pleasant by the TNT area, stated in an interview, we didn't know what we were looking at. We saw a big human creature. You could see the muscles in the legs. We sat there for a minute, looked at each other, and we ended up taking off. And this is when they proceeded to race back to town. We chased by this Mothman looming over the car. They were seeing it in the, in the rearview mirror, in the back window, the entire way back to town. Now, when they got back to town, they went straight to the police. <laughs> they went straight to the sheriff's office. They sent out a watchman. He couldn't find anything there. The creature was gone. Now, this is another thing. As I've said, these aren't people who are trying to get their 15 minutes of fame or trying to profit or anything like that off of saying they saw something weird. These people were regular, hardworking, church-going people, kind people, welcoming people. John Keel said he was extremely welcome in town. Same with other researchers in the UFO community, in the paranormal community that also stopped by Point Pleasant to research these sightings that were going on. All said the same thing. They felt very welcome in town, but they all also said that you could tell something was off. You could tell that these people were in the middle of something strange. You can tell that there was odd things going on in Point Pleasant. The vibe radiated off of everybody in town off of the town itself that you could just feel the oddness in the air but in addition to all the eyewitnesses and the just civilians who saw this there were police officers who saw this there was a story of a blood van a american red cross uh blood van that was chased down by the mothman that was attacking this blood van so not only do you have the civilians who lived in Point Pleasant, over a hundred of them in the 13-month span that saw this creature or also saw UFOs or lights in the sky, the men in black who appeared in town, all of this stuff, you have officials 
that are seeing it too. You have police officers that saw it. You have people who worked for the American Red Cross, the blood truck. So there's no way that all of these people are lying and that all of these people are making this up. Now, when the Scarberries got back to, from the sheriff's office after getting chased into town, Linda Scarberry ended up going to her friend's house. And Doris says in an interview that Linda came in and she collapsed onto the ground, unconscious, just fainted. And then when she came to, they ended up calling the doctor. Doctor came and she was absolutely hysterical when she came into her house after seeing and being chased by the Mothman. Now the next day, the sheriff held a conference at the local courthouse about this sighting. So you could see already, just from the first sighting, that this was taken very seriously by the officials of the town. And this isn't the first time. There were actual hunts for the Mothman. There were people going out at night hunting this thing, trying to find out what this is and trying to kill it. And try to prove that it actually exists. People in the town were afraid to go out at night. People started locking their doors, which in West Virginia in the late 60s, you weren't, people weren't locking the doors. They started to. After all of these sightings of the Mothman, the UFOs, the, the lights in the sky, they started locking the doors. They were afraid. Now, we've talked a lot about the red eyes of the Mothman. These glowing, intense red eyes that are reported with almost literally every sighting of the Mothman from 66 to 67. Now, a lot of the people who reported seeing and having an encounter with the Mothman contracted conjunctivitis or something similar to conjunctivitis or pink eye in one or both of their eyes after seeing the Mothman. Doctors couldn't explain it, and one eyewitness even claimed that his one eye never healed. People were experiencing very, very strange dreams. Others who had encounters with the Mothman were affected mentally ever since. Like, there were people who sought out psychiatric help. There were people that thought they were going crazy. Like, so this... So all of this just keeps on reinforcing to me that something was happening here in this town. And this is just talking about the Mothman. This has nothing to do with the UFOs, the lights, injured cold, the men in black, the other strange occurrences happening in Point Pleasant for these 13 months. Now, when Keel came to Point Pleasant, and decided that you could feel just in the air and from the people that they were going through something, that something strange was happening here. He went around and started investigating these sightings. Besides all of the eyewitness reports that were reported, Keel talked to a number of people who never came forward with things that they saw because out of fear of sounding insane or crazy or out of fear of being ostracized from the community for, for coming out with such weird things. But as he was going around gathering information and documenting these eyewitness sightings, more people that he talked to would, I guess, feel more comfortable and they would come out and tell him and say, well, I saw this or I saw this. I just, I never told anybody. So we have over a hundred documented sightings in 13 months in one area, Point Pleasant, the TNT area right north of it and all around it. That's strange on its own, but who knows how many people saw things that never came forward. Which Keel, as I said, said was a decent amount. 
Now, this sighting happened the day after the Scarberry Mallet initial sighting being chased from the TNT area back to town. This happened on the 16th of November in 66. And this is a very interesting one for me and a very compelling one involving this woman, Marcella Bennett, her brother, and her three-year-old daughter. They were going to the brother's house on the outskirts of the TNT area. Now, the brother noticed strange lights in the sky, and he said to Marcella, Look, there's, it's not a plane. There's strange lights in the sky. And she just brushed it off, oh, whatever, and ended up walking back to the car. And as she approached the car, holding her three-year-old daughter, she says she saw a creature out of the corner of her eye. It was about six feet tall with feathers that it looked just like a very big bird, but a man. And that it was standing with its shoulders up a bit, with its neck twisted down a little, so it kind of like a moth's head. How it doesn't, the neck doesn't extend. She is quoted saying, "She tried to run, but she panicked. She couldn't move. She couldn't run. And then she collapses on top of her three-year-old daughter that she was holding." Onto the ground, she's on top of her three-year-old. And all she can say in an interview is, I, I knew I was on top of her. I figured, she's dead. I, my, my daughter's dead. But I couldn't move. That I was in a trance. So when she regained her ability to move, <laughs> she ended up picking up her daughter, who was fine. And she noticed her... Her knees were all cut up, her hands, like her face was buried in the sand during her trance-like state she was put into from seeing this creature, and she headed to, into the house. They ended up, the brother, her and her daughter, locking themselves into the house, calling the police, and didn't stop there. The creature continued to scurry onto the porch and look into the windows for several minutes before fleeing. And when the cops got there, it was too late, the creature was already gone. But this is a very interesting one to me, the fact that her three-year-old daughter was involved, that this woman was holding her daughter, her three-year-old, and was so taken aback from what she saw and put into this trance-like state that she fell on top of her child and assumed she killed her. Assumed that she smothered or fell on top of and murdered her child. But there was nothing she can do about it because she, she was so frozen in fear she couldn't move. That is very, very interesting to me. And Marcella Bennett says that it was the most horrifying experience she's ever had in her life, and she hoped it's the last time <laughs> that she ever experienced something like that. And who could blame her? Now, this is also one of those cases where I mentioned earlier that Marcella ended up, for months, being severely affected by this encounter and ended up seeking like professional help for anxiety and for trauma and whatever you want to call it, PTSD, from this strange, unexplainable phenomenon that she experienced with her brother. Also speaking earlier of the visions and prophecies and dreams, she to this day, decades and decades later, is still troubled by dreams and visions in her sleep from this encounter with the Mothman. And to just put yourself in these people's situation, to put th yourselves in their shoes, in their state of mind at the time, seeing something like this that you can't explain, which 
Unfortunately for me, I've never had any type of paranormal experience. I've never had any type of extraterrestrial experience. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen weird lights in the sky. I've never seen a ghost. Never seen a phantom. Never seen a banshee. Which, speaking of banshees, are old Irish, Scottish you know, legends of that are also harbingers of doom. And people sometimes link these bird creatures, the Mothman and similar ones, to the legend of the Banshee. That the Banshee would let out a scream and stuff when someone was going to die or when something bad was going to happen. Same with Mothman being a harbinger of doom. But putting yourself in these people's shoes, having your three-year-old daughter in your arms and thinking you killed her, not knowing what you saw, are then being affected by this for the rest of your life. Like, this is a trauma that people were living with and continue to if they're still alive. It's the eyewitnesses who have actually had encounters with the Mothman. It's got to be terrifying. You got to feel like every day since then that your world and your reality has been turned upside down. And you don't know what to make of what you saw. So some of these people were living every day of the rest of their lives in absolute fear and anxiety. And just that alone it is, is a travesty that people had to live like that. Even more so that they, they never got an answer. They never got an explanation for what they saw. Now, Keel was even stated in an interview later in his life that these people, there was n hardly any, if, if any, humor in their stories, that these were genuinely terrified people. These were genuinely puzzled people that had no idea what they experienced. So, just my whole stance on Keel and how I feel that he was pretty unbiased going in and documenting these things. Now, of course, you can say he was into UFOs before this. He was a UFO researcher and into the paranormal, supernatural and stuff. So, of course, there is a bias. Just from researching these things, he's going to be gravitated towards wanting to believe it. But the way he reports it is very, very unbiased and just the facts and just the accounts that he hears he never made any final judgment as i said on what exactly happened here in boy pleasant when asked up until his death he still would say i have no idea what happened he has his theories like we've here like we're exploring but that's it and i think that's a good way to end this episode this was a little bit long but there was a lot in here. So, episode 5 will be out in probably a few days. I'm going to keep the topic a surprise. And let's see if we can finally figure out the identity of the Mothman of Point Pleasant. Take care, guys. <laughs>